So welcome again. Feel free while we wait to get started to just drop your name, what university you go to, where you're either planning on going abroad or would love to go to abroad, and maybe any questions you have for us and our panelists today. My name is Nadine Elmalem, and I'm the Alumni Relations Coordinator here with ISA and Teen, and I am also an ISA alumna myself, having done the McNess Morocco program twice during my undergrad. And today I'm coming to you live with some of our amazing alumni to share more about what you should know before you go abroad. To kick things off, we're going to talk a little more about what we're going to be covering today. So first, we'll go through some general advice that we hear from students all the time about what they wish they knew before, during, and after their programs abroad. Then we'll share some resources for anyone who's eager to get into touch with one of our awesome alumni from any of our programs. Finally, we'll hear from today's panelists about what they wish they knew before they went abroad. So let's just get started. So first things first, picture this. You've settled on your dream study abroad program. You've picked a destination. All of your applications have been accepted and filed away. What comes next? So when it comes to when it comes to preparing for your experience abroad, you'll want to make sure you've got all of your documents in order first. This can be everything from completing your required forms for your ISA or teen applications, um, getting any necessary documentations you need for your student visa, having proof of vaccination status if that is necessary for entering your study abroad host country, etc. Getting all of that out of the way before you leave will make your final days at home and your first days abroad so much easier. And we're here to help guide you through that process, and we'll let you know exactly what forms you'll need to get done. Next, packing. This was a really intimidating step for me. Um, you'll want to be sure, of course, to pack all of your necessities, including um, any prescription medications you'll need for the entire duration of your program, as well as things like, you know, your phone charger. But um, you'll also want to make sure not to overpack. I was guilty of this during both my programs. But in just a bit, our panelists will share more about what they wish they did and did not bring during their programs abroad. And maybe also if they also overpacked, because it happens a lot. <laughs> um, and finally, keeping an open mind. So this is solid advice for any phase of your life or anywhere you go. Being realistic, be patient with yourself, and of course, being receptive to new things. It's a great way to maximize your time abroad and live it up to the fullest. But of course, while you're abroad, once you're in your new home, you'll want to make sure you're ready to enjoy your experience abroad to the fullest. To start, you'll have to exchange some currency. That way you've got some cash to get started. You'll have an opportunity to do so during the beginning of your program. Your on-site staff can point you in the right direction if you're not sure where to go to do that. They'll also help you get a phone plan abroad as well as get acclimated and get to know your new host city. They'll settle you into your housing, give you a city tour, all of that good stuff, so you are not alone. Um, they'll also give you plenty of advice on how to stay safe all abroad. This can pertain to everything from local COVID regulations to general safety measures, um, as well as detailed resources about where to go if you're not feeling well and all of that good stuff, as well as how to um, remain alert and mindful while abroad. Of course, too, you'll want to balance your academic responsibilities with your adventuring while abroad and enjoy those days to the fullest. So our alumni have plenty of advice on how to do that. And finally, be sure to stay in touch with your friends and family. I mean, first of all, you want to flex on them. But second of all, every student does do this differently. For me, it's a big shout out WhatsApp. We love a Wi-Fi call. But again, our panelists are going to share their favorite ways of how they stayed connected with their folks back home in just a little bit. And of course, the most bittersweet part of any semester abroad, coming home. First of all, reverse culture shock is so real. Maybe the way you feel disoriented in the beginning is how you'll feel when you've re-entered the, um, the US. No worries, though. You can keep your memories alive by sharing your stories. And trust me, you'll be sharing these stories for like months. That's kind of why we're all here. We've got plenty of really great stories to share from our semesters abroad. Um, plus, we'll say too, your host city is not going anywhere anytime soon. You can always go back and visit or even do another program abroad. Returning students are actually eligible for a grant towards a future ISA or teen program. So if you want to go back home to your home abroad, or if you want to explore a whole new city entirely, you certainly can. But don't take my advice or take my word for it, though. We've got advice from our awesome alumni. You can check out our Connect with Alumni forum to get paired up with a former student from any one of our programs. If you have specific questions about what it's like being abroad in a certain country or questions related to identity and going abroad, we'll connect you with someone who's been in those shoes before to get those questions answered, including one of our panelists today. Um, you can also hear from alumni and students currently abroad by visiting our blogs. They cover everything from how to navigate public transportation in South Korea to the best vegan spots in Paris and much, much more. So do check that out. And of course, the most important part of today's meeting, meeting our fantastic alumni. They've got plenty to share about their programs abroad and their own advice for you as you get ready to go abroad. 
So let's meet them. Um, if you don't mind, please share your name, what university you go to, where and when you studied abroad. We can start with Marisol. Yeah, definitely. So my name is Marisol Jara, and I went to study abroad this past fall 2021. I went to Sevilla, Spain, and my home university is University of Denver in Colorado. Very cool. Thank you. Um, Christian? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Christian. I go to the University of Central Florida, and I studied abroad in Seoul, South Korea last summer in 2021. Oh. Awesome. And Kirsten? Hi, I'm Kirsten. I am a senior at Arizona State University. I studied abroad in Florence, Italy last summer. Awesome. So we'll get our Q&A session started. And for those of you who are joining us in the chat, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat and we'll lift them up to our panelists. But to get started, I've got my own questions. Um, first of all, what worried y'all most about going abroad? Maybe we can start with um, Kirsten. So probably the thing that worried me the most was like not making friends, not knowing what to do. And the main thing was just not knowing the language. I wasn't fluent in Italian. I knew some basics and I was really worried that I wasn't gonna be able to communicate at restaurants or just traveling around. But I was surprised to like see that a lot of like restaurants and people like know English or enough to like get by and communicate with them. And a lot of menus had both Italian and English. So it was a lot easier than I first um, thought, but I still did um, like think it was good to have like those basic Italian um, phrases, but I didn't need to be fluent to like get around and travel around. Awesome. I know a lot of students feel the same way, but having those survival phrases are definitely clutch regardless of where you go. What about you, Christian? What worried you about going abroad? I think for me, like I, I worried about the language barrier too. Like I, I knew very little Korean before I departed. And I, I was worried how I was going to be able to communicate with locals and also like get around the city. But um, luckily it's, it's kind of the, the same situation with Korea. It's like certain signs will have like the Korean characters and then right underneath it'll have like the English translation. So that was, it was, it was easy to navigate the city and also locals knew um, at least a little bit of uh, basic English phrases. So that it made it a little bit easier to communicate. But in addition to that, like I had never been on my own before. So <laughs> being on my own for the first time in another country was, was daunting. So, but in the end, it was it was a great experience all around. So yeah. Awesome. And I hear you. The first time I went abroad, I wasn't even 19 yet. And I was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? But of course, like y'all all know, we came out the other side feeling a lot better. So that's awesome to hear. What about you, Marisol? What, if anything, worried you about going abroad? Yeah. Um, so I didn't have that fear of the language. Actually, I went to Spain and my first language is Spanish, so that wasn't much of a worry. However, the logistics of getting there and back were one of the things that I worried about. So that was more of like getting through customs and getting into the um, country, right? You know, like having my visa, when do I present it? Or like coming back, when do I like have to check my bags or pick them up, you know? So more of like on the logistics side of it for sure. And I think where the language barrier thing came in was when I would travel outside of Spain um, that was a little worrisome when when I went to France but <laughs> it was it was good it was fine felt that and honestly same here my French is terrible do not ask me to speak French so I relate to you there you did mention something that is always on my mind when I travel abroad it's getting your bags through customs and you know not making them a thousand pounds and full of things you don't need so we'll start with you Marisol just because you're the last one who brought it up what did you pack and what did you wish you had not packed? Yeah, so I guess what I did pack were basic like uh, pants. I, in, in Spain, I would see the fashion was a little different. So I wore a lot of like very loose pants, very flowy pants. So I had some of those that I went abroad with um, and something that I could match a lot of like different shirts with. So that's what I packed most of. It was really great because up until like maybe the last two weeks of my program, I was like in 80 degree weather. So it was amazing for like the end of the winter. But um, 
what I wish I didn't pack. I think I packed too many shoes. I think that I could have gone without that many shoes. I one pair of really good walking shoes and another pair of maybe a little bit more dressy shoes, but shoes that you can still walk in would would have been great. Um, besides that, I think I just bought a bigger jacket while I was abroad because I really didn't have a need for it unless I traveled. Um, so as you are there and as you travel to other places, you feel like you find necessities that you need, but not while you're in your like host city, which was really, really convenient for everything that I packed because I feel like it was I study abroad in code. I don't know if it was going to be useful. Awesome. What about you, Kirsten? What did you bring and what did you wish you had not brought? Honestly, kind of funny because I had a similar experience to that. I think I brought like 20 pairs of shoes and I had pretty much four that I would go through. Like good walking shoes, kind of like a nicer shoe. But honestly, like I walked everywhere, which I feel like was pretty common. So just having good walking shoes was like a good thing to pack. Didn't need all my shoes. And then again, like flowy pants. The fashion is obviously very different in Italy too. Um, one thing that was important, I think, is not many people you won't see wearing sweats. Um, there's like a higher fashion element um, in their culture. So yes, I brought like some sweats, but I never wore them out in public. Uh, maybe if I had a long train day, but I would just like, bring them for like when I was at my apartment, um, just at home, hanging out with friends. But yeah, it's a lot of flowy pants, sundresses, stuff for warmer weather. Um, yeah, just, it's kind of similar stuff to Marisol. It's so funny that everyone so far has been like, yeah, I brought way too many shoes. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, Christian, what do you wish you, well, didn't bring and what did you bring that was really helpful? Was it too many shoes, first of all? <laughs> um, yes, I did bring a couple pairs of shoes that I never touched. So <laughs> That, that's something I, I wish I hadn't brought because I only wore one pair the entire time I was in Seoul. But I, I, because I had to quarantine for two weeks, I, I packed um, according to the associate director's recommendations. So I brought extra of everything. So I had extra pants, extra shirts, like everything. Cause like we're, we weren't able to leave our room. So we weren't gonna have access to like doing any laundry. So we had to have like, extra everything that included toiletries too but also, also they recommended that we bring snacks because we would be confined to our rooms for two weeks so i had um i had snacks and drinks in the luggage that i checked in so um there was that but in terms of what i wish i didn't bring or brought sorry um i live in florida where it's warm all if not most of the year and ironically, I own a lot of jeans and sweatshirts. <laughs> and so I just had a, a suitcase full of the, those things. And, you know, the heat, the heat in South Korea in the summer is a force to be reckoned with. It was 98 degrees every day. And with humidity, it felt like 104. So I, I was just like sweating bullets like every day. So, um, yeah, if if you're ever in Korea during the summer, just just pack summer clothing I would say yeah I feel like I hear that a lot like unrealistic expectations for the weather I thought it would not get cold in Morocco so like Marisol I had to go out and buy a jacket because come November I was very cold and for anyone who's joining us who is going abroad to South Korea they did just get rid of the quarantine requirement so you will not have to pack two weeks of snacks I'm sure I'm sorry Christian but at least you got to figure out what your favorite snacks are um so of course when it comes to going abroad there's a lot of planning and research involved um how did y'all maybe plan for your trips abroad or research kind of the essentials you wanted to bring we could start i guess with kristen i'm trying to think of how i researched it was just like going to like webinars like this um i actually i talked to a few students that had studied abroad in florence before and they gave me a long list of like travel, like places they wanted to travel to, which was important because budgeting, I feel like was huge. I feel like going into studying abroad, you don't really know how much you're going to spend and it can get a little pricey depending on how much traveling you want to do. So just really researching like what locations I wanted to go to. And for myself, um, with COVID restrictions, I stayed just in Italy. Um, so I didn't have that expense, like bunch of expenses because I didn't leave the country. But yeah, just a lot of budgeting, seeing where I wanted to 
what locations I want to travel to. And yeah, I mean, just going to like webinars like this and just like talking to students that had previously studied abroad was really helpful. That is great to hear. I wish I had people on campus that went to Morocco before I went to Morocco because I had a ton of questions. But again, lucky for y'all joining us today, we can connect you not only with one of our alumni here, but let's say you're going abroad to Cape Town, South Africa, we can connect you with one of our Cape Town alumni. So do fill out that connect with alumni form and we'll hook you up that way. What about you, Marcel? What was kind of the prep and the research process um, for you? Yeah, I think similar to what Kristen said, um, with connecting with students that had gone abroad before uh, and just talking to them and see what they had wanted to do. Also, I did it a little bit with like different regions that I wanted to travel to. Um, so that helped me to kind of better prepare things that were versatile for me to be using in like multiple places. Um, but also I think Isa had a lot of like little pamphlets that would like help you prepare your pack, your backpack or your uh, check bag. So that was really, really helpful. I think for me, um, one of the things that I did do since a lot of the advice that is given to you often is to not take like big things that you can buy over there. So like shampoo or body wash, unless it's something that you specifically have to use or that you specifically like. Um, so I bought like those really like tiny uh, bottles for the shampoo, just so like I could could get through my first week you know and while I like got the rhythm of the city and where I was living and everything so um I think that's one of the biggest hacks I guess that I kind of came up with and like it didn't take up a lot of space and I didn't immediately have to land and go somewhere to buy something like there was breathing room for me to to do that but that that's one of the things that really helped me in packing Solid advice. We do love some travel size toiletries, always very clutch. What about you, Christian? To be honest, I didn't do a whole lot of planning <laughs> before I um before I went abroad. I know that I needed to exchange currency. I knew that I needed to um, you know, have things like outlet adapters, which spiraled into like a whole researching of electricity. But <laughs> um yeah, I, I, I didn't do a whole lot of planning, which I, I don't recommend. I think you should know beforehand what you're getting into. But, you know, from, from speaking from my own experience, it all it all turned out OK. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was going to say, too, um, when it comes to kind of not planning, I know that I wasn't, again, 100 percent prepared during either of my programs. Again, brought the wrong things, too many things, no coats, very cold. Um, there were some things that I was really surprised to have found abroad, like I use like a certain thing for like my curls, you know, flexing on y'all real quick, but I found it in Morocco and I was like, wow, the same brand, that's kind of crazy. Was there anything that you saw abroad that you were really surprised by, either in terms of like products or like culture, different things like that? We can start with Christian. Yeah, so I, I remember wandering around different street markets and I would find these little shops that that um, had signs up front. They were like foreign exchange goods. So that that kind of caught my eye. And I, I remember going to one and there were things like, it was like like Jif peanut butter. And then there was like Ritz crackers or Folgers coffee, just things that you would normally find here at like any grocery store in America they had. And um, yeah, I guess Koreans also love those things too. So there was that, and also there was an abundance, like I, I knew this beforehand, but I saw so many McDonald's restaurants and KFCs and just like all these American fast food joints that like Koreans love, maybe a little bit more than us. But yeah, I, I, was, I was surprised to see that, those, those things. Interesting. Okay, so y'all can still get your McDonald's fix regardless of where you go. <laughs> um, what about you, Kirsten? Anything um, that you were surprised to find abroad? Not really. I think it was the opposite. I was surprised about how many things weren't there. Like the grocery stores don't have as many things as the grocery stores in the States. And I mean, maybe something to pack because I hear a lot of people talk about this. I love ranch. I dip ranch I use it with everything. They don't have ranch at stores in Italy. Um, I searched the city, finally found out a restaurant, but that was something that some people do pack that I've um, talked to from other programs because they just can't live without it. 
But honestly, things that surprised that they had, I can't really think of because I feel like it was just they had less than um, less options, which is a good thing, but less options than they have here. Mm -hmm. I've seen those TikToks where it's like Italian grocery store versus American grocery store. And of course, the Italian one is a lot smaller, but I've seen people pack like peanut butter and like Kraft mac and cheese and take that to Morocco. So if y'all got that comfort food, there is no shame in kind of packing that for like a rainy day. Um, what about you, Marcel? Anything that surprised you about life abroad in Spain? Um, honestly, not really. I think that there wasn't a lot where I was like, oh my gosh, like I can't find this or, or this and that. I think, well, actually maybe the biggest thing was salsas. I'm Mexican. And so I use a lot of like spicy food. So my spiciness went down uh, by a lot in Spain. Um, so I think salsas were really hard to find. I personally wasn't looking for tortillas, but I know other people that were, and they couldn't even find them like anywhere, like anywhere in the city. And it was really hard to find them in a bigger city like Madrid. So um, I think that was, I think, I don't know if it was shocking, but I was like, whoa, okay, that's kind of crazy, you know? Um, but that's pretty much the biggest surprise I, I had with food wise and not finding anything. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I'd be pretty shocked about that too. There were tortillas in Morocco, oddly enough, but no decaf coffee. And I love coffee. So I was really staying up late just for my cups of coffee. And I'll say too, again, for anyone who's joining us in the chat, do not shy away from sending us a question just so we can lift it up to our wonderful alumni. I have plenty of questions so we can keep going. And Marcel, I know you mentioned food. I feel like that's everyone's first question about when you go abroad is like, oh my God, how is the food? Um, we can start with Kirsten. You went to Italy, so I want to hear all about the food in Italy. Of course, it was nice, right? I mean, I had a great time at going to restaurants, but I am vegetarian and I don't eat dairy. So some restrictions there. A lot of their dishes will have like meat or seafood. And so I didn't really, you know, get to try any of those. So I kind of sticked with just kind of like the basic like cheese and pasta. I would eat some dairy because I feel like kind of needed to I had to but yeah I mean my I had like paninis like more just like a pretty like paninis um yeah I kind of ate the same thing pretty consistently a lot of pasta it's way better there it really is oh pizza I ate so many pizza I had like a pizza place we'd go to like every day paninis pizza and pasta wow yeah <laughs> that was my diet <laughs> dream come true. I love that for you. Um, Christian, how was the food in South Korea? So the food in Korea is, it's for the most part very healthy. Um, Korea has a has a vast abundance of like, um, was it farmland where they would just like grow vegetables. So there is, there are vegetables that are involved in a lot of their dishes. Um, and it, it, Korean food also tends to be um, Spicy. So if you are a little sensitive to that, just keep that in mind. But, you know, aside from the healthy things, they do have things that they love over there that I would consider guilty pleasures. I saw a lot of pizza places. There was um, a lot of burger places and just like a traditional American food that we love here. So there, there's also that. But um, one thing I was surprised to find out is that meat is considered rich people food. <laughs> um, apparently, Korea doesn't have a whole lot of breeding ground for animals. So that makes meat sort of expensive and kind of hard to get your hands on. So there's that. But for the most part, I think you should um, have an open mind wherever you go, because it is going to be a lot different than what you're used to. Mm -hmm. Very good to know. Didn't know that meat wasn't as much on the menu in South Korea. Interesting. And then of course, Spanish food. How was the food in Spain, Marcel? Yeah, uh, I think the food in Spain, you have your expectation of paella and um, like I, coffee, I think is a big part of Spanish food. Uh, also, there's no breakfast there. So it was quite an adjustment um, to be able to wake up in the morning and just drink a cup of coffee and like a piece of bread. Well, for me, it wasn't too much, but for other people, it was um, also 
part of the food, I guess, aspect of it is like the times that you eat. So dinner in um, Spain is like 10 30 or 11 p.m. So it was quite a change when you are going to school and then coming home and eating and then not eating again till like 11. Um, so that's definitely something to think about in your transition to from the U.S. to wherever you're studying at, like different kind of cultural um, norms, I guess. Uh, besides that, I think that there wasn't a lot of like, I guess, foods that I tried specifically from Spain, but I know that they use a lot of potatoes, a lot of olive oil, um, and I would eat a lot of seafood, ironically. So um, I think that that was one of the biggest things. A lot of grains too. Um, I think my host mom was a really great cook. I was really fortunate. So I was able to try all of those. And even though I was eating a lot of like vegetables, I feel like I did still gain weight from all the good foods. So <laughs> there's no shame in that either. <laughs> Of course. And I've had many a midnight dinner and they are just really fun and weird. It's like, it's 11 o'clock. We're posted up with a big Tajin. It's kind of dreamy. It's pretty cool. Um, I am getting a ton of questions in the chat. Keep them coming, y'all. We love to see it. I've got one specifically for Kirsten. What was it like kind of navigating having dietary restrictions or a different diet um, with the language barrier? So I learned, I can't really remember the phrase now. I learned how to say like, uh, like not me, like does this come with me? I just kind of learned that phrase. And then I would obviously get an answer, yes or no. But also like the menus usually were in English, which was very helpful. So I kind of could see what um, options I had on the menu. It, it really wasn't like that hard to find vegetarian things or things that I, with my dietary restrictions, I feel like most places had a lot of vegetables and there was a lot of like health, I just feel like in general, it was a lot of healthier options, which usually I compared to like more vegetarian things. So it really wasn't hard. I was, I was a little bit worried at first, but yeah, there was a lot of options for me um, in general, yeah. Very good, very good to know. Um, I also have another question. Um, did you get to know your roommate beforehand or do you meet them upon arrival? So I believe that in your ISA and teen applications, you can actually request roommates. If you know someone from maybe your same university who's studying abroad, y'all can actually request each other, I believe. Shelly, you can correct me in the chat if I am horribly wrong. But um, I've been abroad in both an apartment and a host family with roommates. What about the three of y'all? Did any of y'all have roommates and what was it like living with roommates abroad? And of course, what was your housing style, host mom, apartment, student dorm, et cetera? Anyone of y'all got it? Um, I, yeah, I can go. Um, so I did do a host family. Well, she was just a host mom and she had two twins. And I did room with someone that I knew from my uh, home university and we were actually friends. So I did get to request her. So we were in the same room and in the same household. So it was it was really nice to just get to the airport and have someone to go meet your host family with. So I guess that was comforting and all throughout um, our experience we were together. So it was it was really nice. I would definitely recommend, but I would also be the type of person to be open to just being randomly like uh, partnered with someone else. Mm -hmm. I will say both my times abroad, my roommates were like the best roommates I had even in college, I had cool roommates, but these ones abroad were just amazing. So it's great to hear you say that. And I believe as well, you'll get like, before you depart, you'll get a list of like the other participants on your program, as well as um, a guide as to who's housing where. So my last time abroad, it was like me and the two people I was housing with under our host mom's name. So I actually did meet them at JFK and I was like, hey, we're rooming together. We can like talk on this long haul flight to Morocco. So I highly recommend that too. I've got a question for Kirsten. Um, we have questions about what did alumni who went to Europe do about getting a phone plan? Did you get one before you left? So talk to us more about getting your phone set up abroad. Yeah, actually, this is a great question because I had issues with mine. So I did research it before I went and my plan was just to get a SIM card when I got to Florence because um, there was a place that someone had referred me to go to. And it worked for some of my friends, but depending on your phone service, your phone could be locked, meaning that the SIM card won't be accepted and that your phone just won't work. 
And so then I tried to get locked when I was in Italy, but you can't get your phone unlocked when you're in another, another country, at least for my, um, my provider. So I didn't really have a SIM card at my time abroad and made it work, but definitely like look into your phone company. And if you are planning on getting a SIM card in Italy, which is a great option, there are cheap options or like in Europe, there are great options of getting a SIM card abroad because then you don't have to worry about like international fees or whatever, and it could be cheaper, but make sure your phone's unlocked and just like communicate beforehand because my plan obviously did not work. <laughs> Oh, that is tough. That is true. Solid advice. Please make sure your phone is unlocked. You can give Verizon or AT&T or whoever a quick call like, hey, going abroad. But the phone plans are pretty cheap. I know Morocco has a similar provider to Europe called Orange. And I think it was like 10 bucks USD to get um like 100 gigs of data, which is a lot. So your girl had data for days. Um, and yes, WhatsApp should work anywhere you go as long as you have a Wi-Fi connection um, or data. I am a big fan of WhatsApp personally. So even if your homestay or your um, apartment has Wi-Fi, you can use WhatsApp. And then yes, Viber is also a solid one. Um, I've got a question specifically for Christian. What was it like making friends and building community abroad? I know you talked about this in your student blog. It was my favorite part of reading your blog. So let us know more about kind of that experience with friends and roommates and making connections abroad. Well, I didn't know anyone that was from my university that was also going to um, South Korea for this program. So um, I was issued roommates at random and I didn't actually get to meet them until after quarantine, but or well, meet them in person at least. We had this big group chat with everybody in the program. So we were all just kind of like exchanging messages throughout those two weeks. And I, I, I got to become acquainted with my roommates briefly over messaging, but it wasn't until we actually checked into our dorms that I actually met them. And, you know, I think messaging someone and actually talking to them is like a whole completely different experience. So I was still, still worried about if I was going to get along with these guys. And thankfully I did. And um, in terms of making friends, that's having roommates made that easy, but also um, I think the, the shared experience of like being in a new place or, you know, going outside of the country for the first time is, is something that kind of made us bond in a way because we were all going through the same things and it made it easier to like, you know, find common ground. So, um, yeah, I, I think that if you are nervous about going abroad, I think you you should you should bond with those people over that because they you guys are going through the same things so yeah mm -hmm. yes that is one of the nice things about having roommates but also kind of being in your isa or teen cohort all of y'all are in this together you are in the same boat and you are just hanging out in the middle of whatever host country you're visiting so there is a lot of community and a lot of um growth y'all can experience in there what about the rest of y'all? Do you have any um, stories or any advice for anyone who's going abroad for the first time and wants to make friends or find that community abroad? We can give it to Kirsten. Yeah, I actually, I think it was, we had a small group of ISA for my program. I think the program like that all arrived together, there was like 10 or 15 of us and we did everything together. So, um, the ISA uh, people abroad, they like plan events for us and we would all go together and it really helped like make that group of friends because then we would end up traveling together to like different cities in Italy and it just made it feel safer because being in the country for the first time, you may not feel as safe as your home country. So yeah, it was just literally 12 of us like doing everything together because we would go on the events planned by ISA. And I also like would, try to be uh, I made friends with like some people in my classes which was really nice because my roommates had different schedules than me they weren't in my class so after class we'd get lunch together or like go to like a garden or go to a museum and so that was also really helpful just making friends in your classes because you guys do have like similar schedules which can be helpful when you're wanting to explore um, briefly after class or whatnot. 
Very solid advice. Yes, of course, you want to make sure you're friends with classmates, just like you are in the US. Of course, if you ever have to miss class and need to get caught up on homework, but who doesn't like a little like study and chill in a cafe right after class, you know? What about you, Marisol? Did you find community abroad? Did you make friends? Of course, you made friends. What was that like? Yeah, I think one of the advantages that I had specifically in my university abroad is that they had an international office, so they would actually have Spanish students apply to be like an exchange kind of not mentor, I can't really think of like the word, but I guess someone that you would be paired with that is also a that is a Spanish student in the same university. So that way I was able to get to know more Spanish people and go out to places that locals would go out to and make more friends, specifically with people of Spain um, and not just international students, which was really nice because, I mean, you got to see the different like parts of the city from different eyes, you know, not a tourist eye, but as a local eye. Um, and I really enjoyed that part of it for sure. Uh, besides that, I think ISA did really, really well. Um, part of my program had excursions. So I think we all kind of really got to know each other and be able to hang out, you know, outside of our classes and university. So uh, that was also a, a community builder for, for me. Fantastic. And yes, that is my biggest piece of advice. Whenever I'm talking to students about going abroad, even myself having gone back a second time, I'm like, y'all, make friends with locals. Of course, you want to have that local perspective, but you want to get to know other people in your host country. I still talk to my local friends from Morocco like every day. It's kind of crazy. It's been two years. Um, and I wanted to go around real quick too. Are y'all still friends with the people you met during study abroad, whether in person or um or not in person, of course in person, um, whether locals or ISA students, I saw Kirsten answered. What about you, Marisol? Are you still friends with those locals? Um, yeah, definitely. I think in different places, mostly in Spain, a lot of them use more Instagram than they do Snapchat. So it's kind of one of those things where you communicate them on different social media platforms. But yeah, like there are times where you just kind of like swipe up and you're like, hi, how are you doing? You know, so you still talk to them. And I definitely still talk to my host mom. So that's actually a big, a, <laughs> a big takeaway. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yes. If y'all don't um, keep your host mom's contact on WhatsApp after your semester abroad, shaking my head at you. Christian, are you still friends with um, your local friends and of course your friends, your roommates from the U.S.? So unfortunately, I didn't befriend any locals, but <laughs> um, my roommates, yes, those, those guys, those guys are like my brothers now. And, you know, we don't talk every day because, you know, we've all went back to the lives we left behind briefly. But I, I, I do follow them on social media and I, I text them every now and then. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing them again. I don't know when that will be, hopefully maybe later this year, but um, who knows? But yeah, I, I am still, still very much in touch with them. So nice. I hope you all get to do a reunion tour, whether that's in Florida or back in Seoul, that'd be really cool too. Um, we got a question about, I closed the chat, oh gosh. Um, we got a question about traveling um, from country to country while abroad. I'm gonna give this one to Marisol because I know you were in Spain, so you were able to kind of go to a couple different countries. What was that like? And do you have any advice or insight as to what it was like kind of doing, um, taking a train versus a plane and just traveling between countries in Europe? Yeah, um, so when I traveled between different countries, I traveled by plane, but sometimes within a country, I would travel by train. So honestly, abroad, being abroad and traveling, it takes planning, but not as much as you might think um, because it is so accessible and it's so easy to go from country to country in Europe. I also think that when you do go to another country, I think that you find your kind of group of friends where you're like, oh my gosh, let's all go this weekend. And you plan a trip with like six people. So it's really, it's really nice to do that in, in a group, as well as traveling for me specifically from Sevilla was super easy just because the airport was accessible. It was an international airport and I didn't have to do major traveling to and from like an airport that could get me to Paris or an airport that could get me to Italy, you know? So that was really easy. And it was really, I guess, one of the reasons why I chose Sevilla too. I heard a lot of people say that it was easy to travel to and from. Um, 
Uh, did I answer your question? I feel like I'm missing a part. No, that was perfect. I think you covered all the bases. Um, I've got a question for Christian that we got in the chat, and we've also got a really wonderful um, student blog or a awesome blog from a global ambassador student um, on our ISA student blog about this specifically. But Christian, can you tell us more about traveling um, within South Korea and kind of how to navigate the South Korean transit system? Did you get to, did you have to get like a transit card? What was that kind of like? Yeah, so um, South Korea sells these things called um, T money cards. And they're basically subway passes. And you can purchase those in any convenience store you see or in the actual um, subway stations. And the funds never expire. So if you leave the country with money still on it, you can always return and still use it. And um, they can, uh, you can also use them on buses, not just the subway. And what was cool about, what's cool about them is they also, if you know where to go, you can, um, you can get a team money card with like, let's say your favorite Korean celebrity or your favorite Korean idol on them. So there's, there's that. But um, in terms of getting around, I was one of those people that forgot to unlock their phone. So I, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to use the SIM card that they provided for us. So I, I had no access to a map while I was out and about. But that, that kind of put me in advantage because I, I was able to like memorize how to get around and where to go. And I, I started memorizing stops on the different subway trains. And it got to a point where I remember there was this one time me and a group of people were out and they were like, I think we can get there by taking line six. And I was just like, no, that's uptown. We need to go across. And they all looked at me like, how the hell do you know that? <laughs> And I was like, that's that's kind of the, the advantage of like going off on your own and not having an access to a map. So um, yeah, it can be intimidating, but um, yeah, I think with with time, you'll, you, you can uh, you'll, you'll be able to get used to it. Oh, that is so satisfying when like you're abroad and you remember a place and you get there on your own without getting lost. You're like, I knew where to, I knew where to tell the taxi to take me. Like I've peaked. This is great. Um, I did get a question in the chat about budgeting for your program abroad. Kirsten, can you tell us more about how you budgeted for your summer in Italy? Yes. So I kind of researched where I wanted to travel to. And then um, based off what past people have done, um, take trains, like stay at a hotel, um, whatnot, I would kind of budget for those specific events. But then also like food wise, I did try to buy groceries when I was there. But I knew um, that I would be wanting to try like restaurants. So a big chunk for bud or for food and shopping. I Florence fashion thrift stores did a lot of shopping. So I budgeted for like clothing and other like souvenirs I'd want to buy. So yeah, travel, food, and like clothing were like the main three things. Um, and then honestly, I budget I budgeted really high because being in another country, I wanted to be safe. And so I made sure I had maybe an extra $500 like emergency wise. You also never know if you're gonna get pickpocketed. You just don't know like what circumstance, like what will happen. You don't want that to happen of course, but it still could happen. So yeah, just having like kind of emergency cash I feel like is really important um, because you are in another country, you may not have anyone that can help you. And so I feel like that is also a really big thing to think about when you go abroad. Solid advice. Yes, of course. Um, also, pro tip, you don't have to bring your passport everywhere just because, of course, you don't want to drop it or lose it. So definitely, and your ISA on-site staff will give you, your ISA and teen on-site staff will give you tips on how to like remain alert, kind of keep your hands in your pockets, hold on to all your goodies, don't get anything lost or pickpocketed. Um, and so we do need to kind of wrap it up, but I'm gonna ask one more question to each of y'all. So what is kind of that moment you had abroad that you will never forget? We'll start with Marcel. Yeah, um, I think kind of my in awe moment was probably, I had two. I think it was the first, one of the first days that the ISA directors were kind of guiding us through the town and we came upon this cathedral and it's actually the third biggest cathedral in Europe uh, or in the world um, in Sevilla and it was beautiful and I was like oh my gosh I'm like 
like reliving history and stuff like that. And then my second kind of biggest moment was standing in front of the Coliseum. I think it was at the beginning and at the end of the program, actually, I went to Italy for my last trip before I came back home. And I think those were the two moments where I was like, whoa, like this is actually happening or this actually happened. And I was just so happy and I was so, so proud of myself to be able to take that step as well. That's wonderful. I am so glad to hear that you got to kind of have that thing. I made it moment. What about you, Christian? What was kind of that moment you'll never forget? Um, to be honest, it, it never really sank in that I was going to South Korea, even in the whole application process and then actually going there, it never solidified. It wasn't until like I got to the quarantine facility, which is just a glorified way of saying hotel. Um, that I kind of like, it really sank in that I, I am here right now. I'm sitting in a hotel room in South Korea. There's like, I don't, there's a whole other country outside of my window. So I don't know, just sitting there and taking it all in. That's, that's when I, I realized that this, what I'm doing right now is like the definition of living life. I am doing something for me after, you know, going through the whole pandemic situation that is still kind of happening right now. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I like the way you said that you're doing something for you. You are doing the definition of living life. I'm so glad you felt that way. I felt that way too. And then last but not least, Kirsten, what was kind of that, oh my gosh, I'll never forget this moment, moment. So we actually had scheduled a boat tour to the island Capri. And we had stopped um, kind of outside the sh on the shore and we were going swimming. And so we all like, and we were out, like we were in the sea. So it was like warmer water and it was really nice. But she, the person on the boat, she gave us all these goggles and then she would throw food in the water for the fish. And so big like swarms of fish would come like kind of close to us and we could just watch them underwater. And it was just the coolest experience ever and it, it was just like my favorite memory and we were like jumping off the front of the boat like doing like diving like doing flip just like such a great like fun memory um and like such an unreal scenery too it was the most beautiful place I've ever been to and just such a beautiful day <laughs> wow that is kind of one of the coolest study abroad stories I've ever heard that is amazing thank you so much y'all were fantastic thank you so much again to everyone who joined us to hear more about um advice from our wonderful alumni and what you need to know before you go abroad, please do check out that form in our um, chat if you do have more questions for our panelists for, or for any alumni. Again, if the program you're studying abroad in is, is not represented here, we've got alumni waiting for you elsewhere. But thank you so much for joining us again, guys. Have a great day, have a great week, and uh, be well. See ya.